Luke 15, please. Luke chapter 15. I know you know this old story. It's been told many, many times. Um, preachers uh, have told it, and psalms have been uh, written about this old song, but uh, the story ran out. But it's a story about a preacher who's been off preaching, and he, uh, he gets on a train to return back home, and he's seated beside a young man. And this young man seems to be very uh, sad, depressed, nervous. He just he just kind of staring down and, and, and at his knees, and he's just sitting there in the quiet. And so after a while, the preacher says to him, Son, I, I, I sense that maybe you're, you're troubled, and I'm a preacher, and I was wondering if maybe you'd like to talk. And at first, the young man didn't want to talk, and then and with a little more encouraging, he started talking, and then here was his story. He said, I'm just out of prison. He said, I just got out. And he said, um, I got out on short notice, and I wrote my parents a letter. And... Um, and told them that they wouldn't have time to reply to me. These stories work better in the old days, you understand, with text and, and, and cell phones and all that. And the stories don't work as well anymore, you know? So the old stories, they still work. Um, I always call my wife, this is a standing tradition, I always call my wife when I've been out of town and I'm coming back, I'll always, when I get to a certain spot, I'll call her and I'll say, five minutes, and she'll say, okay. You say, why do you do that, Dennis? Because she's got a gun. <laughs> so I wanted to know it's me coming through the door, you understand? So um, he said, uh, Peter, he said, I have given my parents so much heartache. And he said, I don't know if they'll let me come back home, but I don't have any other place to go. And he said, I told my parents in the letter that, uh, he said, our house is by the railroad track, but just before you get into town, he said, I told my parents that, if, I, if they would be willing to let me come home just to hang a, a white rag on the old oak tree out behind our house, and I'd see that, and that would be the signal, and I'd get off the train and, and come home. He said, and I, he said, we're almost there. And he said, I am afraid to look. He said, I'm afraid they won't take me back, and I don't have any place to go. And so the preacher said, it's okay, son. He said, I'll watch for you. And so... Uh, and the train rounds the bend and starts slowing down. They're coming into the little town, and the preacher's face brightens up, and he's elbows the young man. He said, "Look, son, look, son, look, look, look." And the young man looked up and looked out the window, and there was an old man, an old woman, standing under a big oak tree, and then hung white rags all over the tree, and they were standing there holding a bed sheet, and on it they had written, "Welcome home." Well, that's a good story. That's a, that's a good prodigal son. I don't know these people personally, but I know the preacher who knows them. Uh, this young man was uh, just, he gave his parents fits. He, he was in all kinds of trouble. And, um, and, and uh, he was rebellious and he was mean and he was ungrateful and he was on drugs and he was just, you know, he, he was stealing his parents blind. And, uh, and, and one day he had a big confrontation with his parents and he just left in a rage. And he stayed gone for, well, he never came back. Um, and it, it was okay for a while, he made it fine. Because, you know, when you're young and good looking and, you, and resourceful and all that, uh, and healthy, uh, you can make it for a while out there, you know, when you leave home. But you see, you're, you're, once you're, you get broke enough and your health gets bad and your old teeth are falling out and you don't have any friends and um, and your lips are gone, it's hard to make it out, you know, as a, as a rebellious person. And so um, he, um, he woke up one morning in an abandoned house and he looked around him and there were people laying all around there, you know, the men and women. He didn't know any of them. Didn't remember how he got there. He pushed himself up against the wall and he sat there, man, he's looking at these people, he's looking at himself, he's looking at his clothing, and he thought, I, I can't keep going on like this, I just, I, I'm on the wall. So he, show, he, he makes his way back home, and uh, he knocks on the door, rings the doorbell, whatever, and his mother comes to the door, it's middle of the afternoon, 
and she doesn't recognize it at first. That's how bad it looks. And, but then she looks into those eyes, and she realizes that's her son, and she just grabs him and hugs him, takes him in the house, gets on the phone and calls his father and said, honey, our boy's home. Well, <clears throat> it took a few days for him just to recover, to rest up and get cleaned up and for some of his wounds to heal and all that. And so uh, after he kind of got to, you know, uh, back together, his parents uh, invited uh, relatives, and friends, and neighbors and all to come over for a party at their house to celebrate the return of their son. And everybody just made over him, you know, and he was humble, he, was, he had a broken spirit, and uh, he was just, he was just quiet, and everybody just making over him, patting him on the back, and shaking his hand, and hugging him, telling him they loved him, they were glad he was back home. And then after they ate and everything, you know, they all kind of settled around in the uh, living room there. He was in the middle of the circle, and somebody asked him, and he told him, we're so glad you're back home, what made you decide? He said, a week or two ago, I woke up in an abandoned house with people, strangers, laying all around the floor uh, there with me. And he said, it, it, I, I realized that I had not awakened from a night's sleep with people around me who loved me in a long, long time. And he said, I just... I missed that so much that I wanted to try to see if I could make it back home. Well, that's the story of Prodigal Son. Let's read it one more time, and then we're going to read Act 2. Uh, this is Act 1 we're about to read now. The Lord is talking to two groups of people, sinners and the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees don't think they're sinners, but they are. Uh, but they think that the Lord Jesus is uh, ruining his reputation by hanging out with uh, people like the tax collectors and the sinners. So he's talking to both of them. And um, he tells these stories, the story of the lost sheep and then the story of the lost goat and then the story of the lost son. And so let's move on down to the uh, story of the lost, lost son. Jesus continued, verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got ready, got together all that he had, and set off for a distant country. Now, a distant country doesn't have to be uh, a, a, a geographical uh, uh, location somewhere else. It doesn't have to be another town or another state or another country. Uh, it's really a state of mind because the distant country is actually sin. And, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of man, mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to 
celebrate. Okay, let's work our way through these slides just to bring, get, to catch us up with where we were, uh, where we left off this morning. And so we, we see the Lord telling these, uh, these three stories about the lost sheep and the lost one and the lost son. And we realize that each of these stories and the three, they all have the same plot. Uh, and you find the, uh, the, the fact that you find the words lost and found and rejoicing in each of them. And then uh, we're looking at the cycle of life. We're at home and then we leave home and then we, we uh, start a career or we go to a distant country. In this case, he went into the country of sin. And then we come to our senses and we start missing home. And then we want to return home. If nothing else, for the family reunions. Well, that's, that's the kind of way life goes. And this is the way we are as human beings. Um, I need to get away. I need to get away from you. I, I, I'd be happier in another place. I, I, I want what's coming to me. I want what's coming to me now. I deserve to be happy. I believe it. And so, here we go. To the big city. Bright lights and freedom. And what seems like freedom is not always uh, what we... Uh, what we had envisioned, because you see, it never, it, it's fun at first, but it never lasts. It wears on us, and it, and it begins to destroy us. Why? Because this kind of freedom is not real freedom. This is the kind of freedom uh, that uh, eats our soul alive. But we don't realize it when things are going well, when we feel good, when we got spending money, when we got friends, when we're popular, when we look good, and uh, we, 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 we dress well, and, you know, we've got all the things we need. Um, when, when we don't feel needy, then uh, we don't see the need for home or for the Father. But then, as it always happens, things always turn downward sooner or later. Famine will strike, money will be gone, friends will leave, we'll be hungry. And then, of course, that's when we come to our senses because when we get all the way to rock bottom, we begin to wise up and we realize as uh, when we were on rock bottom, that uh, it was a lot better back home than we used to think it was. Because even the servants, he said, the servants in my father's house are eating fresh bread right now. Oh, how I miss the smell of that fresh baked bread. You ever drive by a bakery early in the morning, maybe a donut, a donut shop or something like that? That, that's, that is a smell that I, I, there's nothing that, compared to, that compares to it. It is a delicious smell. Now, I'm putting words in his mouth. He didn't, the scripture doesn't actually say that. But he says this. He says, um, I need a job, and I'm going to ask my father for a job. I'm not going to ask to be his son because I've thrown that away. I'm not going to ask to be his servant because, well, uh, I can't expect that. I, I've, I've, I've uh, forfeited every opportunity to be a servant. I'm going to see if he'll let me be a day laborer. And just check in with him each day and see if he's got any, any work that he needs to be done around the place. And maybe I can earn a few bucks that way. And he says, I just wonder what to say when I get home. He says, I'm going to prepare a speech, and it's going to have three main points to it. I'm going to say to my father, I've sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, and I need a job. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, verse 20, was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Will God run? Yes, he will. And here the father is running toward his son. And then we looked at the, the Rembrandt picture this morning, and here he is, emaciated and dirty and ragged, and, and health is gone, and uh, you know, his hair is falling out, and he's just in sad, sad shape. And he starts that speech. He says, uh, he says, you know, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. But the speech gets interrupted. And the Father says, quick, let's bring him the best robe, which means we're going to honor him. And we're going to put a ring on his finger and give him authority. And we're going to put some shoes on his feet, not as a servant, not as a hired hand, but as a son. And then we're going to grill some steaks. And we're going to have some music. And we're going to celebrate I wonder if they did that slime, the family stone thing, you know, celebrate. I don't know if they did that. But, but then, the older brother. Now, when we get to the older brother, we need to be careful and not be too judgmental of him because, you see, as I said this morning, when you read this story, the father, the lost son, the older brother, um, sooner or later, 
if we don't play one of these roles, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to, and probably in the average person's life, at, at different points in life, we will play each of these roles. And so, verse 25, meanwhile, the older, this is act two now, in a, in a two act drama, uh, the, the older brother, or the older son, was in the field. And when he came near the house, he smells that delicious, wonderful smell of steaks on the grill. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And uh, he hears some music. I wonder what they were singing. I wonder if they were doing Don't Worry, Be Happy. I just, I just wonder what they were doing there. Um, or maybe they were doing one of Fats Domino song. Who knows? Let the four winds blow, let the roll blow, 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 blow. Um, From the east to the west, I love you the best. I think that's probably what they were singing. Verse 26. And so he, he called one of his, the older brother, the older son, calls one of the servants, and he, and he asked him, what was going on? Your brother, the servant says. He's all excited to serve you. Your brother has come. Uh, and he replied, and, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has made it back safe and sound. In other words, your father is happy, but the older son is not happy. The older brother became, verse 28, angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Now, sometimes we make a big deal out of the father running to the prodigal son. But I want you to notice that the father has perfect love. And he goes out to that rebellious older son as well. You see, the father is always the one who does the initiating as far as the, the relationship is concerned between us and him. He's the one who always <coughs> starts the process. He's the one who is always reaching out for us. And so his father went out and pleaded with him. Verse 29. But he answered his father. And he <coughs> says in a disrespectful way, look. Now some translations say, lo, or behold. But he says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never even gave me a young goat, you old goat, so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill a fatty cat for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, old brother, you say, how could a man have an attitude like that? Well, the same way we do when somebody has, uh, has been disobedient and rebellious and they messed up and they've, they've hurt, they've caused a lot of people a lot of pain and they've broken hearts and uh, they've wasted their life and they've caused all kinds of trouble in other people's lives and then here they come up the back, broken people, and we say, yeah, well, you would come back now. And we think, and all along I've been faithful, I've been clean, I've been obedient, I've done the right thing. I haven't caused any trouble. I haven't broken any hearts. I've been right here as a, as a solid, faithful child. And look at all the fuss that's made over this rebellious person who's done everything wrong. And now they're going to come back and get restored. Well, it's easy for us to say, you know, some people just don't deserve grace. And when we say that, that means that we are not willing to fully appreciate and involve ourselves in grace. Grace not only has to, must be received, it must be extended. And if we cannot extend grace to others, guess what? We're not going to enjoy it ourselves. It's just going to be some kind of artificial thing that we, will, you know, we can talk about and sing about, but we don't live it in our lives. Now, <clears throat> We're about to learn that this young man, this uh, this older son, uh, doesn't uh, doesn't really love his father. He doesn't love his brother, that's for sure. But he doesn't love his father. You can tell by the way he talks to his father and the way he treats him. When I was a, a kid uh, in junior high, I went home to spend the night with a buddy of mine, 
uh, one time. We used to do that when you were kids, you know, just ride the, their bus home. And, and, um, and this friend of mine's dad had a, uh, a little country store. I'll never forget when we got off the bus, we went straight into the store. And this friend of mine went over to one of the shelves and picked out a bottle of olives. It was a little tall, slender bottle, bottle of olives, you know, stuffed olives. He took the lid off and he ate and drank, he ate all the olives and drank all the briny juice. He won't know if I want a bottle. I'm thinking, I, I said, mm, no, I don't, I don't think so. And I'm thinking, man, what does that do to your blood pressure, you know, that much salt? Um, anyway, I couldn't help but notice that he was kind of sassy and disrespectful to his father, which, um, you know, it hurt me. It really did. It hurt me. And at the end of the day, uh, it was along about 6 o'clock, um, uh, the, the fathers started kind of closing down, and uh, he went out back to, I think there was some like, uh, cattle feeding things in some bins. He was going to lock up and things like that. And so this buddy of mine said, Dad, I'll clean out the cash register. I'll get the cash. He'll take the cash home. And so he says, come on. And he calls me up there. And he gets this money out. It was mostly $1 bills. But he would do like this. He, his dad's name was Raymond. And he, instead of calling his father, father or dad, he called his dad by his first name. And so he did like this. He would say, with a dollar bill, he'd say, one for Raymond. Then he'd say, two for me. One for Raymond. Two for me. One for Raymond. And he just he robbed his dad right there. Just, just like that. And thought it was funny. And I, I found myself caught in the middle of it. But I, I was ashamed and embarrassed for my friend for the way he dishonored and disrespected his father. But that's nothing like what this, uh, this older son did. He, uh, he really poured it on. Now, um, I'm going to take a little bit of a side trip here, but it won't take long. Let's go to, staying in the loop, let's go to chapter 4. And I want to show you the same attitude, but it's with a different circumstance, a different group of people. Luke chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 14 and following. Jesus returned to Galilee, that's where he's from, in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and it was, and everyone praised him. They were all saying, oh, we're so glad you're back home. We're so proud of you, hometown boy made good. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day on Saturday he went into the synagogue as his custom was and he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him unrolling it he unrolls 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 until he gets to Isaiah 61 where it is written the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim the gospel to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And that word fastened simply means it was like they had an antenna, and that antenna was zeroed in right on him. They were, and they were fastened on him. And, and, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled, and you're here. All spoke well of him, at first, all spoke well of him and were amazed uh, at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Jesus said to them, now he's about to make them angry. Surely you will quote the proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And he's about to show them why. Verse 25. He said, I assure you that there were more, more widows, uh, that there were many widows in Israel in a largest time. When the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of the widows in Israel, but to a widow in Zarephath, in another place, another region, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were furious, just like that older son. 
They were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of town and took him to the bow of the hill over which the town was built in order to throw him down a cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now what's the point? The point is these people were angry because the grace of God had been shared in Zarephath, Sidon, and in Syria. In other words, God was, was being gracious to people other than the Jews. And they were angry about it, furious with the Lord, drove him out of town. That's the same attitude that the older son had. His attitude was this. I enjoy and I appreciate the grace uh, that I get from my father. But it makes me angry when somebody else who, in my opinion, doesn't deserve it, gets the same grace. I don't like it, and I'm not going to like it. Well, you can see the patience of the father back in Luke chapter 15 because he goes out there and pleads with his son. This is perfect love. Because, you see, uh, the point is this. Again, Jesus is talking to two groups of people. Sinners who know they're sinners and sinners who don't think they're sinners. The Pharisees. And really what we're learning here is that Jesus wants self-righteous people to be saved too. Now he wants them to change their attitude. He wants them to, to receive his grace and appreciate it. But he also wants them to get a kick out of seeing other people receive the grace of God. And so he's trying to change the attitude of his older son. Well, this is our story. And, uh, and, and, and But the thing is, is that it doesn't have to be this way. By the way, how did the story end? By that I mean, does the son say, Dad, I'm ashamed of myself. I am so ashamed. Father, please forgive me. I, I, am, I have sinned. I've had a terrible attitude. Um, let's go in there and I'm going to check on my little brother. And maybe he went on and had a good attitude, but we don't know. As a matter of fact, the story ends however you would behave in, a, in the same situation. Whatever you would do, whatever your attitude would be, you know, would you stay outside and pounce? I'm not going in there. Mm -mm. No. Don't want any of those old steaks. And I don't like that loud music and all that, all that laughter and all that joy and all that. That's not for me. I'm happy being miserable. And, I, and you just, you know, uh, you know, I enjoy my ulcers, you know, and that stuff like that. Well, um, we don't know how the story ends because the Bible doesn't tell us. And I think the Lord leaves the story open so that each of us will decide how the story is going to play out in our own lives. I have a, a preacher friend who told me this story. He said that uh, years ago, he uh, and some others went to North Carolina to a town that uh, there was no congregation of the Church of Christ, and they set up a tent, and they had a, one of these uh, you know old time tent revival type things. Uh, I think it lasted uh, two or three weeks, and they knocked every door in this small town, and uh, they happened to become acquainted with uh, with uh, a couple by the name of Tom and Ruth. Now Tom had been drunk for years. And he and Ruth, the resentment between them, and it was the wall of resentment was so high that even though they lived in the same house, they lived in separate ends of the house. They didn't touch. They didn't talk. When she prepared food, she just prepared food for herself. If he made a sandwich, it was just for him. They, uh, they just basically had separate lives, and he was drunk all the time, even though he was employed. And gainfully employed, and so was she. She had her checking account, he had his, and the checking accounts and the next. Well, um, as a result of the tent revival, um, and, and Tom would come and sit out in, in the car drunk uh, outside you know, uh, and the, while the tent revival thing was going on and listen to some of that gospel and smirk about it, you know. And uh, his wife attended a few nights. And, uh, so then they set up some Bible studies. They, they converted some people and they, and they started a home Bible study that went on for weeks. And um, Ruth came uh, the first night. 
And she came back the second week, and uh, after the third week, old Tom showed up one night. And uh, he wouldn't sit around Ruth, he'd stay away from her. She, she was on this side of him, he'd get over on this side. And, and then every week, he would come back, and she would come back. And uh, my preacher friend told me that they began to notice that Tom was beginning to move a little closer, and a little closer, and a little closer to Ruth. Until one night they sat side by side. The next day, Tom took off work early and went to the little plant where Ruth worked and waited on her when she came out. He'd never done that before. She couldn't believe it. And he said, Come on, get in. He said, I got something I'm going to show you. And my friend told me that they didn't even want people to know where they lived because the, the, the hatred and the resentment they had for each other and the fact that uh, they had no incentive to take care of the place and that their house was really just a wreck. But Tom asked her to get the car with him. He drives out of town and drives into a neat new neighborhood, drives into a driveway, and there's a brand new house. And he said to her, Ruth, this is yours. And she said, no. He said, ours if you want it to be. Well, she became a Christian a few uh, uh, days after that, and then after a few more days or weeks, and then Tom became a Christian. And my friend told me that these people became, uh, you know, just some of the leaders in the church over time. Now, why do I tell you that story? Because I'm showing you through this story that it doesn't have to be the way it was with this older son for his brother. We can be reconciled. The Lord can bring us together. We can solve our problem. We can work it out. We can tear down the wall of hatred or resentment or jealousy or anger. Um, and we can put our lives back together again. And just like that prodigal son, after all the mistakes he had made, was able to come back and be received by him. Now that older son needed to not only forgive his brother, but rejoice that his father was happy and that his son, his brother, his young brother, had received grace. How's the best way to get grace? Well, the best way is to be willing to extend it to others. And that's the story, Act 1, Act 2, a two-part drama called The Story of a Loving Father and the Wayward Sons, both the younger and the older. Tonight as we sing this song of encouragement, if you need to come to the Lord, if you need to start solving or letting Him solve your problem, if you've not been willing to receive grace, but you know uh, that in order to uh, extend grace, I should say, but you know in order to extend and receive grace, you've got to be willing to extend it. Perhaps this story tonight will change your attitude and the way you approach even people who call you problems in your life. They need grace too. And I don't know a better person than you for them to receive grace from. From the Father, yes, always. Tonight, if you're not yet a Christian, but you're a believer willing to repent and confess faith in Jesus, and receive baptism for forgiveness of sin, tonight's the perfect time to do so. If you need the prayers of the church as a Christian, why don't you come now? I'll be able to stand and stand.